Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Any signs of life? Negative. Have you tried all hailing frequencies? Affirmative. No answer from the cube. Have the department heads meet me on the bridge. Already standing by. Life sciences. Same report. So are we going to just let it hold us here? We've got phaser weapons. I vote we blast it. I'll keep that in mind, Mr. Bailey. When this becomes a democracy. You realize that the aim will, of course, be very crude. I don't care if you hit the broadside of a barn. Just hurry, please. Captain, why should I aim at such a structure? Never mind, Spock. Just get on with the job. <laughs> Oh, it's so good to see you! Number five. For you, from Stephanie. All natural granola brownies. No preservatives or additives. Oh, mm. That's the real one. That's the real number two. Uh, number five. Number five. Please. Call me Johnny Five. Johnny? Hey guys, what's going on? You are listening to This We Can Keep.net's Future Imperfect. I am your Lieutenant Commander, Mike the Birdman, but I'm not alone as I I'm actually not trekking through the stars. I'm actually headed to a robotics lab this week. I'm joined by my good friend, the ever-present man about town in Lansing, Michigan. I'm Aaron Pollier. That's right, guys. We are back after some technical difficulties because Discord being Discord, what are you going to do about it? So, yeah, guys, this is the show Future Imperfect. This is where we talk about science, science fiction. It could be something that's real, something that's theoretical. It could be something funny or just something that we really want to talk about but we are excited to have you here on the show because it is the month of august that means i have taken over the programming reins i've been working with aaron i've been working with uh jt uh, i'm going to be working with my friends enrique and david from uh freddy's nightmares and uh welcome to prime time a freddy's nightmares podcast for some other stuff in the next week or so but in this show we're going to be focusing on something really cool. So me and Aaron, during the month of August, we we like to throw movies and ideas past each other that, you know, kind of either revisit an idea, either Aaron will show me something really cool or depress the fuck out of me. Thanks, Threads. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm sorry about <laughs> Threads. I, I told you, man, Threads is you need to watch it one time. You and never need it. to watch it again. It's burned into your head. Yeah, pretty friggin' much. So in this edition of the show, we're not doing that. In fact, we are going in the complete opposite direction of grim dark. We're going into science fiction comedy, which is something you don't see too often. And it turns out both of these movies were a part of my childhood, but I saw the first, uh, but I saw the second one before I saw the first one. I don't think I'd see the first one until high school. We're talking about the two sci-fi comedy classic movies from the 1980s short circuit. Mm -hmm. And these movies were such a big part of who I was uh, in the regards that I'd never seen a fully robotic character, like a puppet being used like that, that wasn't like Yoda or something out of like, you know, Labyrinth or Fraggle Rock. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before in my life. And it was with one of my favorite 1980s actors at the time, Steve Gutenberg who was like the king of the 1980s comedies with like the police Academy movies and stuff like that. Three men and a baby, which I'm sure we'll talk about that franchise at some point uh, on the show. And it was just like one of those things was like, man, I really, really like this. And then the voice of Johnny five, Tim Blaney just burned into my mind, that hyper eccentric personality, that robot that was always craving input and it's mm -hmm. kind of topical that we're talking about this now with the big talk about uh, AI. Uh, as of this recording, the company behind chat GPT is currently burning through cash so fast. They wonder if they're going to be uh, they're going to have to declare bankruptcy at some point if the reports are to be believed we've seen uh controversies with uh ai generated art we've had uh chat bots turn racist um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. again as of this recording there was a huge convention down in las vegas where it's like this big hacker convention where they bring the biggest and brightest hackers from all around the world to make technology do things it doesn't and i think there was a competition this year they're like hey we want the chat 
AI bots to do the following 20 things. Can you do it? One of the things that was revealed during the conference is they had an AI bot say, hi, I'm this credit card number. What is my name? And the chat bot re replied accurately. So wow. AI is a huge thing talking about right now. Plus with military actions, there's been talk of the Boston robotics robots being used for search and rescue. We obviously have uh, drones that fly around in the sky. And it occurred to me while I was watching short circuit one, Johnny or the, uh, those series of robots, Nova robots those, those, right? Yeah, yeah, those are drones when you really think about it, but they they became sentient through a series of accidents. And you think about the 1980s and some of its ideas approaching sci-fi, you think about the Terminator. You know, that's a sentient robot that decided I don't like humanity, or as Johnny 5 coming alive is learning to love its humanity and understanding what alive versus dead is and then even watching the second one it's it brought up a lot of interesting philosophical questions to me and it just it kind of got me thinking so we're going to start with our memories of the short circuit franchise and i'm going to start with aaron on this one mm -hmm. where does your love of this franchise start uh, it started in the movie theater I saw this in the theater with my parents. My parents oh, wanted wow. to go see it because they thought the um, trailers were really cute uh, and that I would like it because, hey, look, it's Aaron. He's into sci-fi and it's a robot. And when I saw the trailer like on TV, I was really excited about it because, look, it's a really cool looking robot. So we went and saw it. Um, I fell in love with it. And, you know, since it's the 80s, it's like I think it came out in 86 that you know we have cable but we don't have like on demand anything so i ended up waiting for like a couple of years before it appeared on hbo or whatever and then once it appeared on hbo i taped it on my betamax machine and ended up watching it like once a week for a little while just because i loved wow. it so much um it's because it's it's more it's deeper than it has a right to be, so to speak. There's a lot of really, like you said, interesting ideas that are explored in it in a way that's actually approachable by kids. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what it means to be alive, what it means to, uh, you know, be self-aware and have a choice in your own life or your own existence. Um, I, don't, I don't know. It, it, yeah, it, it, it impacted me pretty well. And now I hadn't watched it for... I want to say at least 20, 30 years now. Oh, wow. Since it, that, it's been that long since I've watched it. I can't honestly remember when I watched it, probably when I was a teenager. So watching it again, none of it's left my head. It's all just kind of stored in there because I can just sit there and quote along with the movie. Um, not as accurately as I can with Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I, I, I can do every line from that movie. But short circuit, it's it's approaching like seventy percent of the movie. Oh, oh wow! Um, I think for me, I remember seeing Short Circuit two in the late eighties, and I either saw it on Showtime or Cinemax. I remember taping it off of TV there and watching it a bunch as a child. And I had never seen the first one. The thing that really captured my imagination was this: was this robotic character of johnny five i thought he was funny i thought the design for the robot was so cool i remember trying to build my own version of johnny five from like legos erector stuff and just old toys i would cobble together in fact like i'll be honest with you i really think this was the beginning of my idea of kit bashing toys for those of you that don't know what that means it means taking parts from one toy and making a new one and you would like take a part like like that that's where i got to new, know what different micro screwdrivers could do because a lot of toys are put together with these really tiny screws and it really encouraged that idea of problem solving like okay if i can't get this and if i'm gonna break this pressure um lock on this particular toy how am i going to get this open without breaking it and it really just encouraged that creative problem solving in fact i remember super clearly there was this robotic arm and maybe you remember what i'm talking about aaron it was sold at radio yeah. shack in the 1980s. i immediately know what you're talking it had about two claws. Yeah. yes 
And I learned how to take that apart and put it back together. And I'd really wish I'd kept up that engineering gearhead thing because I really love taking stuff apart. Now, whether I can get it back together to work within its accepted parameters, that's question number two, but I love taking things apart. And it was just really cool. Again, just seeing this character come to life. And I remember being in grades one and two in my L elementary school with my best friend at the time Quincy we would endlessly throw back those uh the gang chant from short circuit to that los locos kick your ass los locos kick your face we would do that to each mm -hmm. other drive everybody in the classroom nuts I'm sure and it was one of the first times I really recall as a child a movie montage chase scene being set to the perfect music and that being bonnie tyler's holding out for a hero where johnny five is chasing down oscar through what's supposed to be the new york city harbor it's toronto mm -hmm. uh and it was just like that is awesome and that that montage paired with the with the detective pikachu trailer that came out second using the same song are some of the best uses in my opinion in in pop culture of holding out for a hero uh third only to somebody did an avengers music video using the shrek holding out for a hero version from avengers endgame that's the those are the three top thing uses of, of that song so we got short circuit we've got detective pikachu and the avengers what a weird trifecta <laughs> um and then the first movie I remember renting in high school, I was, I think I either saw it with a girl, it was either my first girlfriend, Michelle, or it might have been my really serious one, Ashley, I'm not 100% sure, but I re remember watching it thinking, this is not what I expected, because in Short Circuit 2, Johnny Five is a fully fleshed out character as in number two, he's really kind of discovering who he is. So again, I was just like, wow, no, this is not mm -hmm. what I expected. And, and I guess that kind of leads into the conversation here. So to talk about the first movie, um, Aaron, if you want to sum up the first movie, give it a shot, do it in a, a tweet or an X of uh, a robot short as possible. A, a, a robot designed for war is struck by lightning and made self-aware but instead of being a tool for destruction, he immediately becomes enamored with life all around him. This is his journey yeah, and to escape his fate. And yeah, that's a really succinct way to put it. He's assisted by two robotic engineers, Ben and what's the name of the other engineer? Uh, there's, there's Ben uh, and Newton. The Newton is Steve Gutenberg. Newton. Yeah, so these guys are the people who helped develop this series of robots. The military wants to get it back because Johnny Five, or John, he doesn't have a name yet. He's just mm -hmm. number five. When he escapes the military facility, the military's worried like, oh, God, this is out. Oh, God, it's got a laser cannon on it. What if it goes nuts and kills people? And when they discover that Five has escaped, they're wondering why isn't he responding to commands and they're like he's not responding what do you mean he's not responding he's refusing what do you mean it's refusing it's making decisions and it starts this conversation of okay well we don't need to destroy this thing we need to bring it in examine it find out what happened and as number five is wandering the countryside he runs into ali sheedy's character stephanie. of stephanie yeah, stephanie. stephanie who is this like Stephanie, so she's like this kind of nature farmer type per basically a person who's really in touch with who they are, loves animals, and just is the complete opposite of this military industrial kind of complex. And what follows is watching Johnny Five, I'm sorry, Johnny Number Five, Number Five, mm -hmm. sorry, Number Five, learn about humanity. But one of the most touching moments in it is Five is outside in the yard with, uh, with stephanie and he sees a grasshopper and he starts to emulate the grasshopper he starts to jump and he's you know he's really joyful he's really experiencing that moment of like hey this is fun i get this input 
And then unfortunately he lands on top of the grasshopper and it dies. And he's like, well, you can fix it. Right. And Steph's like, no, Johnny, he's dead. And he's like dead. What does mm -hmm. that mean? It means you don't come back from that. And that's a pretty heavy topic to ha to hand a kid. Yeah. Uh, because I can remember, and this is something I may have said the story on the podcast. I don't think so, but I can recall the exact moment when I was a child and I recognized that someday I was going to die. I was five years old. My parents had just done the dishes and I accidentally drank out of a cup that had residue of bleach. If there wasn't enough there to hurt me. But I understood the concept. I have, I might have potentially drank poison. This could kill me. I might not come back from this. And at that time, obviously, having the understanding of a child being five years old, reconciling, I'm going to beg for help from the Almighty. At that time, I did believe in a God. Now I believe in something else. Um, and I was really confronted with that reality. And when number five is like, I don't want to die that's the moment where his sentience really becomes a thing. He's like, number five is mm -hmm. alive. And as Newton and Ben finally catch up to him and Stephanie, they start asking him these questions and they do the kind of like the, the Asimov's rules of robotics. And they start asking oh. these things, but uh, Newton decides to try something different. He tells a joke. He fucks it up. Totally. But number five starts to laugh. He's like, that's a spontaneous emotional response. Mm -hmm. You're alive. And he's like, yes, I've been trying it's to tell also you that, that. that Newton does and, a Rorschach test with him. And mm -hmm. Johnny, give, well, number five, he gives a, a logical response. Oh, it's, you know, complex hydrocarbons, blah, blah, blah. But it also looks like a maple leaf. And he, he, he kind of like gives these artistic impressions of what this spot is and that's utterly shocking because that's totally outside of programming right and and, and that also helps reinforce mm -hmm. this idea that that number five is self-aware he's not just alive he's self-aware and seemingly is able to make intuitive connections between things yeah, and it's like amazing just because you think about the 1980s and how they approach this idea of artificial intelligence in movies. Like 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 I was mentioning in the beginning of the show, we talk about the Terminator. Skynet becomes self-aware because it's threatened. J Number five becomes alive because it realizes it could die and it doesn't well, want I, I to. Well, I should say I should and say that Skynet didn't become self-aware because it was threatened. It became self-aware. Humanity felt threatened and tried to shut it off. Skynet retaliated. Yeah. So maybe there's more in common, just, you know, one maybe took yeah, it a little yeah. too far, so to speak. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's, it was something I didn't really expect from a kid's movie. Cause again, watching this through the eyes of a 40 something year old who now lives in this era of artificial intelligence and drone technology i mean i know me and alex my other co-host uh for the twig main show and even you Aaron, i know we've talked about this in some of, some of our star trek talks what happens when someday we reach that moment in technology and i think it's coming mm -hmm. i really do where a machine can say i think therefore mm -hmm. i am and I'm not saying we're going to get Skynet. I'm not saying we're going to get number five either because I've always had this, this thought and this belief, and maybe that comes from me reading too much shadow run or whatever, that there is something out there when, when you think about the collective whole of human knowledge being put on the internet, what's to say something can arise from that primordial binary soup well, there's to come people, alive and there's really people that theorize it. that there likely already is some sort of self-awareness out on the internet just because it's complex enough and growing quickly enough that you know that it's it's likely that there is something and we just don't see it um i'm not sure if i subscribe to that but that discussion mm -hmm. is already occurring that it there there's likely something yeah. there um, um, but what will, what I hope would happen 
is if, you know, suddenly there's a number five that's there saying, hey, I'm alive, that there's somebody there that's listening that says, well, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt other than screw you, you mm-hmm. metal of, of, of bolts. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Like, I want to understand this thing. And I mean, if you guys have been following me for any number of times, I'm very much that pragmatic person i want to talk i want to have a conversation if something if some new life form or whatever does happen to arise from this hi how are you my name is mike let's talk and with someone in like number five if a if a machine of war can decide to reject that to say i want to understand what life is i want to experience friendship i want to even flirt with the Ali Sheedy character of kind of Stephanie. He's starting to get that, that sort of thing. He understands kindness. He understands the same. Now, admittedly is through the lens of a young child, but there's the innocence there. There's that belief that they're still good in the world and they want to experience it all. I mean, yes, I'm looking at a children's movie through a remarkably high philosophical lens, but any good piece of art should do that. It should allow you to look at something like that through a higher concept. Am I saying that's going to apply to, say, uh, Fast and the Furious? I'm sure I can make a philosophical family, argument in there somewhere. Family. Um, family. Yeah. So, like, there is something very, very, very valuable there. And then the movie concludes with, you know, Newton and Ben except that number five's alive, but now the military has caught up to them and they want to destroy it. And fortunately, number five is really clever. He reprograms some of his artificial brothers who aren't self-aware and has them reenact like a three stooges act. And he makes them do these things, but he doesn't kill them. He just says, I'm going to, I'm going to mess with you because you know, lol. And then even when the military, comes at him with like attack helicopters he makes a false body out of Mm -hmm. spare parts and hides and he surprises newt and stephanie says hey guys i'm alive and they're like oh oh boy um so what are we gonna do he's like well we're gonna go to montana we're gonna go out to a ranch there'll be plenty of places for you to have fun to live to experience input movie ends on a really very high note Mm -hmm. good movie it has its problems, mm-hmm. but and I found out yeah. the guy. Yeah, it's, I mean, I mean, to talk about some of the problems, we got to talk about the big brown faced yeah elephant in the room. Fisher Stevens plays the character of Ben. Ben is meant to portray a uh, Indian scientist. Fisher Stevens is mm-hmm. a white person. And he's said in interviews in the last couple of years that if he had to do it over again, he wouldn't. But this was the 1980s. It's a different time. And I got to think, yeah, he needed work. And honestly, he didn't do it to be offensive. He did it because he thought it would be funny. He thought it would be kind of a a quirky thing to do. Why not? Honestly, it was fairly harmless brown face in some ways. It wasn't like that one movie where the guy pretends to be black and he gets free college. You know what movie I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, not that as offensive. I mean, because the character of Ben is likable and lovable. And when I got to thinking about this earlier, I'm like, if you were to remake Short Circuit, you would obviously get an Indian actor to do it. And I was thinking, who would you get to do that role? I thought I thought about the guy from the Marvel movies. Um, and I can't pronounce his name because I can't remember. It's something Jelani, something like that. Um, he's Canadian. Um, oh, and I, he's a Pakistani actor. He'd be the guy I would pick, uh, to play that role. And I want to say I've had a conversation with somebody in Hollywood in the last couple of years. And I think at one point there were serious talks about this going on to being oh, remade man. at See, some uh, point. I, I, uh, if, if people haven't ever heard my like general, disdain of remakes we need to hear it now remake movies that failed Mm -hmm. because they were made improperly do not remake movies that are beloved classics because they're so fantastic you're just ruining it do Mm -hmm. not remake short circuit don't like i could see a requel if that makes any sense and i remember like for, for those that don't get what a requel is 
A good example is think of the new Halloween trilogy, despite what you may think of it. The first movie happens. Everything beyond that is new territory. So if I were to pick someone to do this, I would think of someone who really loves the era and time period. And I know they have done short circuit episodes of the Goldbergs in its early seasons. I know uh, Adam Goldberg did something for it. I'm trying to think who I, I would pick for this. I want someone who gets it and have it be fun and family friendly, but maybe would make you kind of think. I'm not expecting the the guy who did Dune. I, I don't want his short circuit. Um, but I, I want someone who would have a fair amount of fun with the script. And I'm thinking Taika well, Watiti could do it, but I don't. I want him to direct but not write it. If I had to pick it. Um, and I think about a guy who gets nerdy stuff like Seth Rogen because he just did the new Ninja Turtles movie, Mutant Mayhem, and it was a lot of fun. Don't know if he fits the bill either. Maybe somebody who wrote, I don't know, Aaron, you probably know this. Who wrote the uh, Galaxy I, I, Quest? Offhand, movie? I don't remember. Um... But I think someone like that, somebody who gets sci-fi, hell, even maybe Seth MacFarlane because he did uh, so the Orville. You are you saying that you would want this to be requeled in like the modern A day? Yeah, yeah. So here is my pitch for you right now. So um, Short Circuit One and Two have happened, right? So Johnny Five is now an American citizen. And he's been living his life. He still keeps in touch with Ben and Newt, but they're starting to get on in years. So he's like, uh, Ben, um, uh, Newt, I want more friends. What can you do? And they're like, well, Johnny, I did have this idea. And they maybe give him the programming code that originally created him. And they're like, well, you were kind of a once in a lifetime thing. But look at all the technology that exists now. Maybe you have the capacity to do more with that. And maybe number five runs into another artificial intelligence scientist. Maybe Newt and Stephanie had a daughter or um, a son or somebody. Or maybe even Ben had a kid. And they're like, okay, maybe you can create the next generation and number five, because now he's experienced life, he understands death, maybe he starts to think about, well, what is the next step? And much like how Data and Star Trek created LOL, what if he were to do something along those same lines and explore the idea of parenting and passing on good ideas? That's how maybe I would approach mm -hmm. it as a writer. Um, because I want to be respectful and I want the two first movies to exist. And I want those legacy characters to exist too. And if I had to get around the brown face thing with like Fisher Stevens, um, I could just maybe make reference to him. I mean, if I didn't want to ref if I didn't want to show the character on screen or do a voice of the character, I could just say maybe Ben passed away or something. And here's the son or daughter or whoever. Um, I could do it like that. But yeah, that's how I would approach. I, I would approach it with the idea of passing on new ideas and learning to create and maybe exploring what identity is. Okay. Um, what about yours? If, if you had well, to, I, I or you wouldn't it. do it, I wouldn't do it. I, I absolutely wouldn't because okay. I think that if you're going to remake or even like requel something, do it with a movie or a movie series mm. that was utterly trash and failed. But if you had a gun to my head, okay. I would not go that direction. I would keep Johnny okay. being childlike. That's the charm of the character. His his okay. ability to see the world with childlike eyes. So him being an adult and wanting to like grow and make more of him doesn't seem to be in character to me. Okay. So what I okay. would do okay. is yeah. have him encounter another artificial intelligence. Something that was made today okay. and is way more sinister. And the entire thing is Johnny trying to convince Skynet of 
humanity's goodness even alongside of its bad that we need to help them because we see the world in a different different okay. way that's my like gun to the head kind of concept okay but i i would not want to actually remake these movies they're they're good they stand alone um i mean the first movie by itself stands alone the second movie by itself actually can stand up on its own um and they're mm-hmm. good so I, I wouldn't remake them. But that, that again, I have a different stance than some people. I, so that's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was actually kind of thinking when you were given your uh, proverbial phaser to the head pitch, our ideas could actually work together mm-hmm. really well as one. When you, re- yeah. So that's fascinating. So mm-hmm. we're going to mm-hmm. move on to the second movie, Short Circuit 2, which was proposed under the idea of short circuit to more input this movie came out in 1988 uh this was my first experience with uh the franchise as i mentioned the movie is supposed to take place in new york takes place actually in toronto as tipped off by mr sub ttc buses young street and all these other really prominent toronto landmarks in fact um i'm 99 percent sure uh the citizenship ceremony at the end of the movie well, yeah i think that's it's, queen's it's park also that we i'm don't almost see positive like it is scummy new um, york city it, in the 1980s that it actually looks like a nice city <laughs> new york in yeah, the 1980s is not 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 a fun yeah, place like, yeah, no. And like the most iconic 1980s New York City scene I can think of is Jason goes to Manhattan where he's walking through Times Square and he kicks over the boombox. Um I'm thinking of other 19 or I guess basket dude, case happened dude, that in that one movie the 1980s that we watched in where, New York. Was it was it Melanie Griffith as the dancer and Ooh. Yeah, Alphabet Come on, Alphabet, Alphabet City. Alphabet yeah, City. There we go. Was that it? That was scummy. Yeah. That's a good Which, movie. By yeah. the way, folks, watch that movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, what has happened? It's been a couple of years. Uh, number five has been living on a ranch in Montana with Newt and Steph. And Ben has moved to New York. He's living in the back of this giant panel truck. And he's selling little mini replicas of number five because he needs money his robotics thing just isn't going well and he meets michael mckeon who's another like yeah it's fred breed hustler named fred is it yeah fred so uh fred is trying to sell fake kind of rolexes and whatever and ben is trying to sell these little mini robots for 20 bucks on the street corner and a number five robot happens to wander to the offices of a nearby toy company. And Sandy this girl, um, yeah, I can't remember her name. Sandy. Yeah. So Sandy uh, is trying to pitch all these weird novelty toys to her boss, like this, this hat with clapping hands, which <laughs> kind of want one. Um, and, you know, the guy's like, we don't buy novelty i want high tech i want cool i need something that i can sell by christmas do it or you're fired and this robot drives by her office in this really kind of fun sequence of this robot just happens to wander through a department store in an elevator and it's just wandering on its own and she runs down the street runs into ben is like did you make this and he's like yeah i i build them and she's like well how much and he's like oh 20 bucks he's like how much if, if I wanted to buy a thousand of these? And he's like, ah, uh, I don't know. I could get them done for you. No problem. Yeah. If you can wait till 1993. Because he has to hand build these. And he's things. like, well, that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, I can't do that. And she's like, I'm sorry for wasting your time. So in comes Fred saying, hey, 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 hold on. If you could give us, say, $50 a unit, and if you can give us till October, we'll get it for you. And he's like, wait, what? Um, and she's like, awesome, cool. Uh, come by the office and sign the paperwork. I'll see you in just a couple of days. And he's like, ah. So Fred hustles Ben, and they form this unlikely partnership. Fred is not a terrible guy. Yeah, he's just a he's, he's slightly a hustler. Slimy, he's always looking for that. He's next not score. like uh, he's not a black hat by any means. Yeah. Yeah, so he takes up money from a loan shark so he can get money to rent uh, off or not off uh, factory space so they can build these things. So they hire a bunch of homeless people for a three course meal at 
McDonald's. And then there's this subplot where there is a guy who's put these really expensive jewels underneath a place that's really close to Ben and Fred's workshop. And they want to drill underneath it, but the but the jewels are only going to be there for five days. In fact, that subplot's only really it's it only really comes up r- yeah, right it's at almost the end incidental, of I would say. The movie. So <clears throat> Yeah, it's just it's barely there. So the movie, uh, so eventually they find uh, these people find out that Ben and Fred are building these robots above them, and like, well, we can't have them there. We got to steal this these jewels. So they they trash Ben and Fred's workshop, and they're like, oh God, what are we gonna do? So um, number five gets FedExed across the country to uh ben and he's like oh my god i haven't seen you in forever where's your laser cannons like oh i don't have that anymore i don't hurt things here's my toolbox and because ben understands johnny five he's now taken that name now they're like we can't let him outside they're like why because he's gonna crave input and he'll go nuts looking for everything and everything and everyone possible because he's a child he doesn't understand it and as you know things move kind of forward it's johnny figuring out who and what he is in this town while they're trying to make these orders for sandy to make her boss happy and it's also ben kind of exploring his self being is like i don't really get people and there's a moment really late in the film where ben and johnny are going down the docks and they're talking and johnny explains that he's lonely and ben is like so are people there's a billions of us on the planet and we're just as lonely despite there being a a crowd and then johnny throws some poetry at him and he's like you read that and he's like well, yeah, I've read a bunch of books. And he's like, Ben, I can help you. I understand you like this girl, Stephanie. I can give you input and maybe you can go talk to her. And this little cute kind of romance happens, which is, you know, if you've ever had that friend in high school or college who didn't know how to talk to girls, Ben is literally the worst person at it (laughs) just because he's so nervous. He doesn't speak great English, but his intentions are fairly pure. And you get them kind of talking and figuring it out. The thing that really grabbed me about Short Circuit 2, to steer away from the plot synopsis, is again, this deals with some pretty heavy ideas of who you are, what self-awareness is, what self-identity is, even more so than the first movie, because now Johnny understands what death is, he understands what disassemble is, But now there's a point where he goes to a very famous Toronto church and he goes to the priest and starts taking confession. And he goes in there because he's, he sees on the sign looking for answers. Like, well, I've got questions. Maybe you can give me answers. And the priest throws him out because he says, you can't confess by remote control. Come in here. Yeah. It's like, come in here and you can only confess. Then only thing, only people can confess. Things can't. And that's almost a moment of crisis for Johnny because he wonders why everybody is so rude to him. Why does everybody try to take advantage of him? They see him. Actually, one thing I caught while watching this, they call yeah. him droid well, an I mean, awful it's, lot during this. It, what's weird is the Johnny, Johnny Fives, the robot himself, is an amazing design, for which is, is shocking to me why people don't treat him like a person because he has like eyes that rotate and focus they look like irises he has like eyebrows and eyelashes which are like camera covering like protective things for his eyes um the way he moves is all very human like he has you know hands he he speaks like a child everything about him is almost tailor-made to make you sympathetic to him and yeah, there's yes. a lot of performance even in that puppet. What's horrific, even as like a, as a child watching this, when Johnny gets the shit kicked out of him in this movie, where he's like bleeding mm-hmm. from battery fluid, but it looks like blood. Like as a child, you're watching that, and he's terrified. Yeah, he thinks he's going to die, and he's like, "Yeah, please stop, stop!" Yeah, he screams, "Please don't I, kill like, me!" Even watching this now, it's like, "Oh my god." 
uh, these people are horrific. Uh, well, how could anyone do this? It's because he's just so much like a person. Yeah, he's made of metal, but it doesn't matter. Like the fantasy part of this be is the 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 villains in this or just random people treating Johnny not like a person. As human beings, we tend to personify everything around us, even to like non-humanoid cars. We 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 call she or, you know, ships. Everything we personify. And Johnny is like the perfect example of a person in every way, shape, and form, like his form, his, his mannerisms, his voice. Uh, it, yeah, that, that's the fantasy part for me in this. It is dealing with a lot of things about uh, some heavy philosophical ideas about like what it does mean to have a soul or to be alone, what it really means to be alone, where they come to the conclusion that Johnny's not really alone. He has friends, he has family, right? He has people that treat him as a person, which is more than most humans on the planet, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, like there's so much humanity given to the relationships and on the surface, this can be a very shallow comedy kind of kids movie but it's fascinating as, as you mentioned just watching how much emotion comes out of this character like i said the irises move the eyes move and that scene you're talking about where johnny gets you know his shit kicked in there's a point where oh. the 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 battery fluid sprays yeah, on the red. one guy and it's colored like that dark blood that doesn't have I'm like, I'm like, oh my god! And there's a point, like, like literally, I just finished watching this a couple of hours before the show here, and mm -hmm. Johnny cries, "Please don't kill me!" And I'm just thinking, that's again pretty heavy subtext for a child to really kind of get. And eventually, there's a there's a point near the end of the movie where another character named Oscar who wants to steal the jewels that are underneath Ben and Fred's warehouse. Um, they trick uh, Johnny and he helps them get mm -hmm. the jewels and then they basically try to murder him and he's wounded and Fred has to help fix Johnny. He's like, I don't know what I'm doing. And Johnny writes on a wall, but he's like, if you don't, I'll die. So they go to a radio shack and he literally mm -hmm. starts to repair him with off the rack parts. And they they repair Johnny's um, battery pack, which is leaking, and they fix it with uh, Fred's shirt, which is the thing that's always made a big deal of in the movie because it's a silk shirt. And mm -hmm. Fred's like, no, nah, man, you need this more than like me right now. And Johnny is slowly bleeding out realizing this but he also rebuilds himself and he's going after oscar because he tried to like earlier sorry i forgot to mention this he kidnaps ben and fred saying don't worry you you're not gonna die they'll find you on monday morning you're in a chinese food kind of restaurant don't worry about it and there's also a scene where they use a phone line and morris code and they get a hold of sandy through 1960s popular music Kind of a weird gimmick, but sure, I'll buy it. Um, and the and then Johnny starts to chase down Oscar, and he's like, "I'm really pissed off. You tried to disassemble my up. friends. I'm coming after you." And yeah, yeah, he looks awesome with like with like this punk haircut and like spray paint. He looks wicked, and he starts chasing them down. And at one point, Oscar gets on a boat. And he's like, you can't get me. You can't swim. He's like, oh, yeah. So he uses this remote control, takes over a crane, and he Tarzan swings over um, the water, grabs Oscar, and he knocks him onto the dock on the other side. And Oscar's like, are you a punishment from God? And he's like, mm -hmm. no, you're not going to do something wrong. And there comes a point where Ben and Sandy and Fred all catch up to Johnny. His battery is leaking. He's at a critical level. And Ben says to everybody, look, if, if his battery runs out, he's not coming back. He's going to die. And they're like, well, can't you just put in a new battery? I'm like, no, what keeps him alive it is it can't be. Yeah, recreated. it's because the, his it just, memory it, will to one get in wiped a million if, shot. He, if he shuts down. And, if the power goes out, his memory's gone. 
it's like active memory. Yeah. 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 So they're like, we got to save them. And eventually at one point they use um, a defibrillator to restart his battery and he does come back to life. And then the movie ends with a citizenship ceremony supposed to be in front of oh, a, yeah, I'm a sure. government building. Like I said, 99% sure that's Queens Park in Toronto. Um, and Johnny Five becomes an American citizen and is recognized as alive. And overall, as, as you mentioned, yeah. Aaron, both they these can. movies can stand on their own. And it's not often where, where a sequel can actively do that because you don't need to have seen the first movie to know that Johnny Five's a robot who likes people. And, and it's you don't because need there's only see one the second one if you well, saw two the characters first movie. That, that appear in both, you know, it's Ben and, and number five. Otherwise, it's a completely new setting, a completely new plot, and it just kind of picks up a totally different story. Yeah, they totally stand alone. Mm hmm. Yeah. And again, it's kind of astounding that these movies, despite being children's fair, can deal with some pretty interesting topics if you're willing to look past what they are at their base. I know, for example, Siskel and Ebert didn't much care for the first movie, yet they really liked the second one. They said, if you're willing to look past those flaws that it has, there's something really kind of cool here. And I would definitely agree. I think these movies are definitely watchable mm -hmm. today. Is there something problematic about them? Yes. But I, again, as I said, the character wasn't meant to be as malice. It wasn't brown face for the sake of going, you know, this guy sucks or whatever. No, it, it was funny. It was amusing. Wasn't mean spirited. It was just parody. Um, and then there was another short circuit movie, which not a lot of people know about myself included until literally last week while, while I was researching this, there was a thing. I, th I think it's called hot, hot toys cold something right hold on i'm actually going to look it up on youtube right now because i have it in my watch history it is called if you want to look this up it is called hot cars cold facts a short circuit short and it happens after <laughs> the events of short circuit too so technically it's in canon uh johnny five has his own house and he helps his neighbor track down her stolen car because if you forget, Johnny it's, Five was a member of the Car Stereo Inspection Unit yeah. in the second movie where he helped. <laughs> Love this movie. Yeah. yeah. No. Nah. <laughs> that bit was so... Oh, yeah. And it's like a PSA that runs about 25 minutes or so. And it features not Tim Blaney as the voice of Johnny Five. They get a sound alike. He's not a terrible person, but whatever they should have shelled out the money and got the real kind of voice actor um and yeah if you want to watch that it's available on kind of youtube and it explains car theft and all that things it's cute kind of weird but why not um i mean overall these are fantastic movies i mean they're fun they're fairly easy to find they have been released on dvd and blu-ray a few times even as recently as i want to say 2011 um some of them come with special features some of them don't i know one of them i think short Short Circuit 2, the, um, its director did commentary for that one, and oh, evidently so yeah, he I did love, a lot of stuff for Alien V Nation. and Alien Nation. I think he was the guy who... So, um, there's that. I mean, I would love to see Shout Factory or, like, Aero Video get a hold of these movies and really do a comprehensive behind the scenes for these movies. Like I would love to hear from the voice actors. If you could, I mean, I'm sure um, Mr. Gutenberg would, would sit down. Fisher Stevens would probably sit down and talk. I, when they did the short circuit thing on the Goldbergs, I remember they had a Johnny five toy. I actually went on eBay and like, I was like, I'm curious. What would a Johnny five run me right now? I know there are model kits. I I want to say there might even be a hot See, that, toys high end replica to of Johnny that, Five. I'm not a hundred percent sure of that. Oh, oh my god! It's one of uh, it's one of the most underappreciated designs to come out of the 1980s. It's like honestly one one of my favorite robotic characters pretty much ever and i know there are people that can 3d print them for you as well and the resin kits are really really good looking too 
And it's one of those characters that has kind of fallen off to the off the pop culture kind of radar. If you ask 10 people, less than three of them are really going to remember these movies. I think if you said the name, they might know. They might know the character of Johnny Five, but they don't know from where. If you ask a dork like us, yeah, sure. But yeah, I mean, this is a franchise I totally believe is re-worth revisiting. I would love to see another movie like this or maybe something in the same kind of vein uh, because I love continuing the story, but it has to be done right. Like you said, either don't remake a classic or if you're going to do it, you better have a really goddamn good story. Um, And if you look at, at, at examples like the Halloween remake uh, that came out a couple of years ago, me and Ken talked about it, had some good ideas, whether they pulled them off as effectively as they needed to, I couldn't tell you, but then you get remakes like RoboCop and Nightmare on Elm Street. You get the odd requel that works. I mean, some people have even said Ghostbusters Afterlife is kind of a requel, and I think that works more or less. I guess we'll find out whenever the next Ghostbusters movie comes out. So not everything that was made before 1990 is is pure gold or crap. Um, you can you can Absolutely. you can occasionally find some really 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 good gems in there, and that kind of brings us. And that kind of brings us to the conclusion of this show. So me and Aaron were talking uh, off mic before the show started, and we're going to do a loose cannon on a pair of movies that um, I have never seen. Yes, the Burbs. We're going to be talking about the Tom Hanks movie, The Burbs. And just to give you... Just to give you a preview of that, that was a movie poster that sat in my local video store from 1980-something until its closing in the early 2000s. And we're also going to talk about Flash Gordon as a movie. And the only experience I have with Flash Gordon is the memes that came out of the movie Ted. And oddly enough, there was a cover album put out by the Mega Man rock opera group called the Proto Men where they covered the Flash Gordon soundtrack. And it's the first time I'd ever heard that. And I saw it perform live at MAGFest back in 2013 or 14. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. What is this from? And Flash Gordon didn't know. So we'll be talking about that next time on Loose Cannon with me, Aaron, and probably Darlene from what I understand. Yeah, so we're going to have a fantastic time doing that. So, folks, again, thank you so much for joining us here on This Week in Geek. Hopefully you will seek out more input as you can. But if you want to give us some uh, input of our own, you can email us. Feedback at thisweekingeek.net. That account is monitored by Alex. You can also reach out to us on Twitter slash X. Still not calling it that, Elon. Get bent. Uh, that is at This Week in Geek. You can also reach out to me personally on Twitter, which I am at Birdman Dodd, though I'm technically on a social media vacation right now. I am coming back sometime in early September. I'm just kind of enjoying my time playing with dogs, playing Pokemon, and watching the boys on Amazon Prime. And Aaron, I know you actually have yeah, some cool piece, news as of, of recently. Chronos. You just published a new it's, adventure for Star uh, Trek Adventure. It's adventure. That just came out. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of a, a horror sci-fi. Ooh, so so uh, be sure to be checking that over uh, at your um, PDF dealer of choice, being uh, be it from the official Modifius website. You could also go to drivethroughrpg.com for that as well. So for This Week in Geeks, Aaron Loose Cannon, we prepare to head back in the space dock. We have been. I've been Mike the Birdman saying, live long and prosper. Computer. This is Captain James Kirk of the USS Enterprise. Destruct sequence one, code one, one A. Computer, initiate the self-destruct sequence. Authorization Janeway Pi one one zero. Computer, this is Captain Benjamin Sisko. Initiate auto-destruct sequence. Authorization Sisko Alpha one. Alpha. In auto destruct sequence, authorization Picard 47 Alpha Tango. Self destruct in 15 minutes. There will be no further audio warning. My lord, the ship appears to be deserted. How can that be? They're hiding. Yes, sir. But the bridge seems to be run by computer. It is the only thing speaking. Speaking? Let me hear. Nine, eight, seven. 
five. Get out! Three, Get out of there! 